Good morning and welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to have uh, all of you here and our special guests, Terry Goddard and uh, Peter Fritsch. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to the presentations and the discussion this morning. I also want to acknowledge uh, a partner in crime in this event, uh, uh, the Immigration Policy Center and Mary Giovanoli. Uh, and it's always great to, to have and partner with them. And uh, uh, so uh, we've done, this is the second one of our uh, joint efforts. We did one back in September of last year on, on the border and border security issues. And Terry Goddard also presented at that time. And it was such an interesting and good discussion that we decided to, to repeat it around this issue of money laundering. Um, what we're going to do, I think, is uh, um, I'm going to run through a few slides, a few uh, points that we'd like to make uh, related to this. Uh, we commissioned a paper by Selena Realullo, which we've copied and, and have out there on the table. Uh, Selena uh, works with and is a professor at the Center for Hemispheric Defense uh, Studies and uh, unfortunately couldn't be here today. She's in Central America providing training uh, on these issues, uh, transnational criminal organization uh, financing uh, and money laundering. And so we're enormously indebted to her for her work and her paper. Uh, I'm going to do my best to present some of the ideas that she uh, put together for that paper. Um, and then Terry's got a number of slides and, and his own uh, experience and his own paper as well. I hope you've taken advantage of that out there on the front table. And then we'll have Peter uh, kind of uh, respond to us, comment, correct our mistakes, fill in the holes. Uh, Peter has enormous experience uh, both as a Latin America correspondent for the Wall Street Journal and also in his current work. Um, so that's sort of the lineup. That's the process. Um, and uh, we should have time at the end to um, take some questions and, and discuss this matter, complicated matter, in, in greater detail. Um, when we think about combating uh, drug trafficking, organized crime, um, but particularly drug trafficking, um, Usually, we think in terms of uh, interdiction uh, of the product and the uh, eradication of the product in the field. Um, there's elements of that strategy, that third strategy that's here domestic uh, in the United States. But in general, drug policy has focused uh, around the issues of eradication and interdiction. Um, Money laundering is part of that process, but seems to somehow, especially in the context of interdiction, get short shrift um, and not as much attention and focus. And I think part of our goal today is to focus some energy in that area, to discuss it, to look at ways that we can do a better job of fun funding the, fighting the funding uh, for organized crime, and to to say, to make the case that it's worthwhile uh, as part of the policy uh, that we're pursuing to combat transnational organized crime. Um, one of the issues, however, is that while we know it's a big problem, the funding, we really don't have a good idea how, how big a, of a problem it is. I was, I'm mindful, if, if you can bear with me a second, of uh, an old movie by a Robin Williams movie called uh, Good Morning Vietnam. I don't know how many of you. It's so old now, it's probably uh, on one of these uh, outdoor summer festivals with uh, the sound of music and uh, singing in the rain, right? You can rent but it for a buck. Yeah, <laughs> right, you can rent it for a buck. But in there, he plays a disc jockey, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of a character as a disc jockey. And there's a break for uh, the weather. And his response, and that always sticks with me, is, you know, how, how hot is it in Vietnam? And his response was, it's, it's real hot. It's damn hot. It's incredibly hot. But how hot is it? No idea. 
Uh, and I feel that way a little bit about the money question and organized crime. It's big, there's gobs of money. Uh, we throw around huge figures, uh, but when you get down to it, how much money is it? Uh, we really don't know. And I think that's kind of point one here. We know it's a big problem, but we don't know how big or how that problem is, is, is evolves and how it, how it takes place. Uh, so uh, we, don't, we don't have a good picture of the overall volume of illegal drug trade between the United States and Mexico. Uh, we don't have a good idea of how dirty money is brought back to Mexico. NDIC says, the National uh, Drug Intelligence Center says that Mexico is the primary placement area for U.S. generated dirty money. But we don't know what that means, how much of it goes back to Mexico and how much of it is shipped internationally back to the Andes, say, to purchase uh, cocaine uh, and continue the process. It's not the case that all of the money that's generated by drug sales in the U.S is going back to Mexico. It may be the primary placement area, but we don't know really at the end of the day how much is going back to Mexico. Uh, some estimates uh, are that really only about 20% of the money goes back to Mexico uh, because it's all that's needed to continue to grease the skids to make it possible for the cocaine and other illegal drugs to pass through, the corruption, uh, paying off of the mules, people transporting, all that sort of thing. That that's actually a small percentage. Again, these are estimates. How much is transferred back electronically? How much is transferred back in bulk cash? And through trade-based money laundering uh, systems. And this is a new, maybe not new, but something that we're increasingly aware of trade-based uh, money laundering where uh, the value of uh, products, a container of toys or a container of clothing or a container of uh, electronics are either undervalued or overvalued as a way to launder the money, uh, depending on what you're doing. Uh, we don't really know what the percentages are. Uh, I've seen from NDIC, again, the Intelligence Center, estimates that it's the majority of the money returning to Mexico is returning in bulk cash. But the majority of what uh, is the big question. What is the majority of uh, 2 billion, uh, 15 billion? Uh, it's a little hard to know. Here are some U.S. government estimates uh, over the last few years give you an idea of how hard it has been for the U.S. to figure these things out uh, and how much they've varied over the years. Um, I think the number that is most often cited in the news, uh, the one that appeared in this year's, the 2012 International Narcotics Crime Strategy Report, INCSHER, International Narcotics, what is it, Brad? It, strategy report, I'm sorry. Uh, the one that's most often cited is uh, somewhere between uh, 19 and $39 billion. That's a huge range. Um, so that gives you an indication as well of how little we know about the actual volume of uh, money being laundered. Here are some estimates by a researcher in Mexico um, that seem pretty good. Uh, I, again, they're estimates, they're uh, calculations, uh, but trying to make a breakdown of what, uh, from the Mexican perspective, is the volume uh, of the trade with the United States. And, you know, if I could just uh, grab a couple numbers here, uh, they're estimating roughly $6.2 billion dollars to $8 billion, that's considerably less than the, the 19 to $39 billion that uh, is often cited in the U.S. Um, now, the other big part of this is, of course, seizures. 
Um, and uh, there are, of course, um, ways in which there's asset forfeitures and freezes of assets um, that the U.S. government uses, the designations of kingpins, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, very important tools that the U.S. government uses and that the Mexican government is also increasingly uses, but obviously there's, there's a long ways to go on that front. But in terms of CAS, if we assume or take uh, just as a for sake of argument that the majority of the money returning to Mexico is in bulk cash, we don't know majority of what, but we know it's a majority or we think it's a majority. And then we look at what has been seized. Uh, bulk cash seizures in the U.S. totaled uh, $798 million from January 2008 through August 2010. Uh, that's about $25 million uh, per month. And that's just a straight-out division. I don't mean uh, anything beyond that. But it gives you an idea that if you were to use sort of the quasi-official numbers of eight, 19 to uh, uh, 39 billion and say half of that plus one is bulk cash, I mean, we're really talking about a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of money being seized. Uh, a cash, I'm sorry, being seized. And likewise, in Mexico, since 2002, Mexico has seized over 457 million in bulk currency shipments. Uh, a big chunk of that came in one seizure in 2007 uh, when one uh, Chinese national was found with uh, uh, $200 million in cash. Uh, so uh, if you were to sort of take that out as the exceptional case, uh, you would see that you have very little left there. And so um, in 2010, bulk cash seizures amounted to 32.4 million U.S. and another 7 million in pesos, really, again, a very small amount. So I don't mean to paint s a totally pessimistic picture here, but I do think it's important for us to recognize that in some ways one of the missing elements here is better data, better analysis, better understanding of the size of the problem. We all agree it's a problem, it's a huge problem, it's a gobs of money, but really how much is it and how is it being transferred and what techniques are being used. So with that upbeat <laughs> preface, I turn it now to former Attorney General of Arizona, Terry Goddard, uh, who is going to talk to us about his own research and findings and work. Um, he, uh, as you know, and there's a bio out there, I hope you will take it, was a two-term Attorney General of the State of Arizona, uh, was a leader on consumer-related uh, work, um, but also a leader in combating uh, transnational organized crime as it affected the State of Arizona and took a real leadership role um, with some of the uh, wire transfer companies uh, and, and Best Western who had been caught up in this kind of uh, activity. Um, so we're delighted to have you with us, Terry. Um, I'll make the quick switch here okay. if you want to go to the podium and you'll explain how this is all easily solved and dealt with and, uh, <laughs> and we'll move on. Oh, you confused everybody. Thank you. Well, let me thank the Wilson Center and the American Immigration Council for the chance to put some of my thoughts together that have been running around in the eight years that I spent as Attorney General of Arizona and uh, the year and a half since uh, where I have came to the job believing money was the most important aspect of criminal activity. I spent eight years sort of proving that to myself, and, and now I'd like to, to try to, uh, uh, to prove it to all of you if that's not – already been done. Um, how do I move that? Down? All you have to do is click this one. Okay. I'm, I'm not here as an expert on money laundering, but I've got some slides about it, and I love the way they look. So I will, I will go through uh, some of the patterns uh, just based on uh, uh, both to emphasize the variety and also some of the ways of apprehension that I believe have been overlooked. Um, I am from Arizona, 
and I'm highly frustrated with the conditions on the U.S.-Mexico border. That may not surprise any, uh, anyone here. Um, but what might be a little different is I'm not frustrated based on last night's Fox News. I'm frustrated basically on eight years of working in the criminal prosecution investigation area and seeing so many missed opportunities and so many chances going forward where we could be doing significant good in securing our border and, and helping to support the government of Mexico, and we haven't been doing it, in my opinion. Um, I am not here to bash uh, the federal government, except in a few isolated ways, uh, because I think they have made a tremendous effort on the border. I've worked with uh, members of the uh, Customs and Border Patrol and with ICE, uh, and that ramping up just in the state of Arizona has been extraordinary. Uh, you can't walk in the town of the city of Nogales without bumping into somebody in a green uniform. So the idea that we're not trying hard, at least in some aspects of the national effort, is absurd. Um, but what bothers me as a law enforcement official and continues as a citizen is that we got a tremendous resource in the time old adage of you go after the money. The number one way that you attack organized crime is you take their resources away. The people that work for the cartels, wherever they may be, are not doing it out of love of the work. They're not doing it out of religious zeal. They're doing it because they're extraordinarily well paid. And you take the money out of the program, and I believe much of the threat and much of the sophistication which allows the cartels to attack the border between the United States and Mexico with such success is because they are so well remunerated. And we'll talk a little about that and what we did uh, specifically in Arizona. Uh, here's what happened, and I came into office in 2003. Uh, we estimated there may be as many as a million people a year, and, and like Eric, I don't have uh, precise numbers. Uh, you know, the one thing about criminal activity is they don't do annual reports. They don't do quarterly reports. They don't tell you what they're actually generating. So it is frustrating. You have to guess, and you try to do it as well as you can, and, and frankly, I take uh, some exception to the, uh, uh, the statements about marijuana earlier. I do think it's the number one cash... Uh, operation, but I, it's not what I'm here to, to argue about today. Um, I also think that the flood of cash is, if anything, underestimated. Estimates of the drug market are as high as $80 billion a year in this country. Uh, obviously, it doesn't all go back to Mexico. Much of it is spent in overhead in this country. Much of it invested in trade-based uh, money laundering, but an awful lot of it goes back. And what we see in the Southwest is literally a flood of cash. And it's not just bulk cash by any means. I, do th I don't agree either that that's the majority of the money being repatriated. It's simply too easy to use the banking system, the money transfer system, and the trade base system to move cash with much less risk than putting $100 bills in shrink wrap packages and trying to drive a semi-truck across the border. That's pretty high visibility, folks, and it's not the kind of business I'd like to be in. There's a lot safer ways to do it. But in Arizona, uh, almost 10 years ago now, uh, we had a huge flood, some say as high as a million people a year, but let's just stipulate an awful lot of human beings. It's a dangerous trip. I think we've heard a lot about that. And you don't necessarily want to have $100 bills in your pocket when you do it. In fact, that would be suicidal. Uh, so there had to be some other way to pay the coyote, some other way to get across the border. Uh, so I started out with a couple of advantages in Arizona. Uh, we had some uh, individual operatives in our office who were among the best state-level uh, money laundering people, I believe, in the country. Uh, Kip Holmes, in particular, is somebody who spent his life working in the area of combating money laundering. He wrote the statutes in Arizona in the late 90s, and now he's uh, tasked to enforce them, and he does it very well. One of the things we did, based on some warrants uh, served on, uh, by the way, it's, it's Western Union, not Best Western, Eric. It, it, ah, I don't want to get that. the hotel yeah. chains uh, Western Union. Uh, too angry uh, with us. But, <laughs> but we ended up with sort of a, an interesting relationship with the largest uh, electronic money transmitter in the world. Uh, Western Union has about 80% of the market, if not more. Uh, and they clearly had a huge volume of business in Arizona. And what we noticed from... And, and, and we serve subpoenas on them so they be protected. But it was a very collegial uh, in enforcement or investigative effort at the beginning. Um, and basically what we found was that Arizona was an extraordinary cash sink, that a tremendously large number of wires were coming in. Now, these are not cross-border wires. These are wires, and let me emphasize uh, – uh, uh, oh, I'm going to 
screwed up. Okay. This is not a great map, but I think it'll show you that I'm not talking about the border yet. I'm talking about money laundering within the United States. And what we had was uh, approximately 100 to 1, cash into Arizona versus money being sent out. That doesn't make sense. We didn't have any business that was sucking in that much uh, cash that it would explain 100 to 1 send-receive ratio disparity. So we went to work, as you should, uh, trying to say, okay, why does that happen? And uh, the only real clear explanation that we came up to, because if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a prosecutor, almost everything looks like a coyote transaction. And so in this case, we figured, well, that's probably what it is. And we went, uh, we were able to confirm that by going to some operations which were particularly virulent. Uh, there were some small shops, one in Douglas, Arizona, that was doing something like $10 million a month. A little one-horse operation. There was, I, I don't want to disparage Douglas, one of my favorite places on earth, but it's not a big uh, industrial or financial magnet. There was no real clear explanation why that much money was coming to that location, except illegal activity. So we went in. We sent in a, an investigator posing as an agent for a criminal operation to receive wires, and as you know, I'm sure, the maximum you can receive without a federal report at any one day is $10,000. So the, our agent would go in and he would take wires off the, off the uh, he'd, we'd already arranged this, of course, and um, he would get $9,900 in receipts, and then he would pull the identification that the clerk had been using to, to log in those, those wires, and he put out another one in a different name, different photograph, and the clerk just went on writing them down. And uh, by the time he did this the third time, and was now around $30,000 of receipts, uh, the clerk looked at the um, identification very carefully and said, you know, this isn't very good. <laughs> if you go down the street uh, about a block and a half on the left, my cousin does a much better job of producing a driver's license that looks like you. Uh, so bottom line, we knew we had some problems. And we worked with Western Union. We got many of uh, these clerks uh, prosecuted and, and got them uh, uh, out of the system, but it was a system that was apparently just bleeding money to illegal activities. So uh, at that point, we uh, went a few steps further. We had the opportunity to use geographically targeting orders so we could require additional information. For the, based on the additional information, it was very clear uh, that people were, you know, same person, same fingerprint, uh, was using multiple identities to pick up wires. And so based on that, we started using sweeping warrants. And those started out with a description, not only of the transaction, but of the individuals, because there was a fairly small group of agents that were actually picking a picking, pickup specialist, we determined they were. And um, we, uh, we used the, uh, uh, the, the names, but the, the one of the things I, I want to emphasize is that we found that our opponents were incredibly malleable. Uh, they change quickly, and a sweeping warrant that was on the street had its maximum impact in the first couple of days. We got the biggest seizure uh, of all, and then it would fall off rapidly because the coyotes and the people behind them would figure out that, hey, okay, they're looking for Jose, or they're looking for someone else. Somebody, we'll use another pickup artist, or we'll use a different location. Or if they're looking for denominations of $1,000, we'll start sending 750 It didn't take long for them to adjust. But in the course of about six years, we did over 25 sweeping warrants. We seized over $17 million. Uh, a drop in the bucket, I will be the first to say, in terms of the total amount. But the most important thing was we did a, learned a lot about the operations, and we changed the behaviors. And let me emphasize the change in behavior. Um, this is a map over, um, or a chart, I guess is not a map, from January 04 to the end of uh, 2006. Uh, so a relatively short period, you can see that the, the, these are monthly totals, so we're going up to over $35 million a month in receipts uh, of $500 or more. We're just looking at the larger wires. And they fell off by the end of this period, and the, 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 the most precipitous down sweeps are when we uh, had just done a, a particularly uh, successful uh, seizure. Uh, I, I should emphasize that the, the pattern, and I, I skip over this part most of the time because I assume everybody knows it, but if you want to be smuggled in the United States, you make a small down payment in cash to the cartel agent south of the border. The rest of it has to be paid quickly and relatively anonymously once the individual gets to their location. 
So wire transfers are the avenue of choice. They are clearly a very quick way to, to move money. They can be done at, they can be picked up at many locations uh, throughout the world and they um, are under the way they were being administered essentially anonymous because as I mentioned the, the use of uh, identification at the pickup point was loose at best when we started out this procedure. So bottom line is we had a significant impact. Now did we stop uh, the smuggling, oh, I'm sorry, this is the uh, receive to send ratio at 100 to 1 at the beginning of this effort, and we get down to almost 1 to 1 by the time we finished a couple, three years later. Um, now, it finished uh, for a reason, just as a quick sidelight. Uh, we were thought we were being so successful, we had displaced the business. And we had reason to believe that we displaced it into northern Mexico. And so now imagine Cananea and Altar and, and uh, uh, San Luis being overwhelmed with literally tens of millions of dollars. It's not a pretty picture, but that in fact was what was happening. And uh, so we decided to serve some of our warrants on Western Union offices south of the border. Uh, as many of you who are skilled in international law know, there's a little jurisdictional problem here. And it took three days for Western Union to respond and shut down that particular effort. Uh, subsequently, the Arizona Supreme Court said in, in, in very restrained language, the Arizona Attorney General has somewhat limited jurisdiction to operate in a foreign country. Um, something that I, I regretted at the time, but I think I understand what they meant. Um, but here we, uh, we worked uh, with and sometimes against Western Union for a number of, of years in this process, both getting data from them so that we could analyze the whole sweep of the millions of transactions that were taking place across the border and within Arizona. Uh, and then ultimately uh, we decided that the hostility was certainly not working on either side. We sat down in the end of, of 2009 and by February of 2010, mm -hmm. we had a, a basic agreement as to how to move forward. And uh, the, the thing that gets emphasized usually is the $94 million. That's certainly a nice number. Uh, but again, in the context of what we're talking about in their world revenues, it's not that much. But the main commitment was twofold. Uh, a, to change internal procedures, to make the kind of clerk that we ran into in Douglas who would cheerfully sell you a new piece of identification, uh, get them out of the business for good, for always, and to change the internal procedures so that the SARS, the specific activity reports, were being filed uh, diligently and, and, and quickly. Uh, and the second part was we needed the data. Uh, there have been fights over how much we could get and what geographical areas we could see. And through this settlement, we basically got a treasure trove of information going back five years and going forward in virtual real time as to what the transactions by wire were in the southwest border. Uh, we sat down with the other three western states because this couldn't be done by one state alone. And so ultimately the, uh, the border alliance was formed out of the settlement. Whoops, sorry, I shut it off again. Um, these are the, the, the operation uh, organizations that got involved uh, because Western Union put $50 million into a pot and that is now being used as a grant fund by states in the Southwest, specifically for money laundering and other border-related crimes. So although it doesn't have to be money laundering, what we wanted to do was to raise the bar so that state governments suddenly or now had a reason to use their police powers in looking after financial crimes. Now, just very quickly, this involves three Arizona agencies, the Arizona Attorney General's Office, their Department of Financial Institutions and Highway Patrol, as well as the Phoenix Police Department and then the states of Texas, New Mexico, and California. So those are the, the nice little medallions around the, uh, the circle there. This is their website. I encourage you to take a look at it. Uh, even if you're not law enforcement, it, it has some good information about what's going on. Here's their mission and uh, current news. And I know the Wilson Center does the best job of clips in the universe, but these folks may have a short, a close second. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little about schemes of money laundering, and again, not to lecture you about how it's done or the nuances, but just to talk about some of the different mechanisms that are in play and why I think we could do a much better job of moving against them. But before I do that, I want to focus on one particular aberration, which is, I believe, absolutely incredible. Six years ago, the Department of Justice issued a report that said that stored value instruments were a major weakness in our cross-border movement of cash and cash equivalents. Uh, as you probably know, these little cards that can Im involve a very significant amount of money, usually I have a little card when I do that, um, but they look like this. This happens to be a debit card, but a stored value card has no visible distinguishing factors 
from this particular piece. Uh, there's nothing in uh, statutes or regulations in the United States, although it requires you to declare $10,000, if you have anything over $10,000 of cash or cash equivalent, it doesn't require you to say anything about a stored value instrument. So it could be a $100 gift card from Target, or it could be $100,000. It doesn't matter. You don't have to say anything to the customs officials about it. And six years ago, the Justice Department, in its wisdom, said this is a serious problem, and it needs to be fixed. A few years later, in the, in the Credit Card Reform Act, Congress said the same thing. This is a serious problem, and you've got to fix it by, I believe it was February of 2009. But the regulations never came out in February of 2009. Finally, in 10, there were some regulations, but they didn't cover the international transportation of stored value cards. They changed the name to prepaid access cards. That's a big step forward. Uh, but did not do anything about moving these potentially, according to their own estimates, extraordinary, troublesome loopholes across the border. And it still hasn't been done, although proposed regulations have been submitted by FinCEN uh, and are supposedly being uh, finalized. Uh, but I've got to ask, I think we all have to ask, six years? What in the world does it take from the analysis of a serious weakness to fixing that weakness to, to, uh, to deal with this problem. And I think, as Eric said at the beginning, it may be just money laundering has never gotten to the kind of priority that I believe it deserves. There hasn't been the kind of focused attention to say, hey, this is the way the cartels are getting the money to kill 50,000 people in Mexico and to create havoc on the United States border. And the fundamental way that that happens is because of the cash. Uh, okay, I'm going to talk a little about, and I, I promise you I won't spend much time on this, but I think the various ways that money does cross the border are worth examining. And the fact that we don't have a clue, as Eric said at the beginning, about how much is going or where it's coming or which is the, you know, I keep asking the question, which is the preferred route? I think the answer is we don't know at all. And if we figured it out, it would change. It's like, uh, I think it was Israeli that said that the, uh, the problem with the Irish question was whenever you got the answer, the Irish changed the question. <laughs> well, we can move that to international affairs here in uh, uh, Israeli? No, it wasn't Israeli. Anyway, I'm sorry. We're not, I'm not, my British history isn't that good. Uh, but okay, the, the basic exchange, uh, and, and Mexico has made some major steps forward uh, from the time that I was first in office when they had very little power or exercised very little power over the movement of money. Uh, that has changed significantly, and among other things, um, they uh, now require the, or they would prohibit large amounts of dollars being held by Mexican citizens and Mexican banks. Uh, I believe it's $4,000 maximum, $3,000 maximum. That, that has had a significant impact, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But so th the difficulties are you've got to get the money illegally across the border, and you've got to get it converted into pesos. The, this is the standard that the cartels are faced with, and they've been able to find many ways around it. Uh, essentially, the first one is the peso scheme, and um, I, I'm not going to use black market because I really don't think that's the right, uh, the right appellation for this problem. The black market existed in Colombia for peso exchange. It doesn't exist in Mexico, as best I can figure out. But what we have here is a third-party uh, transaction, basically. You sell drugs in the United States, you get dollars. And either the drug dealer himself or an agent of the drug dealer then goes and either acquires goods or services with that money. The goods are transported to Mexico, and the money is paid to, again, an, either an agent or the cartel people themselves in Mexico. And mysteriously, this money, which was drug dollars in the United States, has turned into legal pesos in Mexico. The deal is over. Um, a truck has probably, let's take that as an example, uh, somebody takes a, a check for X number of dollars from a third party. Uh, the, the, the person who's actually buying the truck does not appear, does not write the check. The person that's buying the truck is somewhere in Mexico paying discounted, by the way, pesos for that product and receiving it at a very good price. Um, now that has morphed into another that you probably just read about. Uh, a gentleman named Wang was uh, arrested uh, and indicted anyway. I don't know if he's been arrested uh, for uh, moving some money to China. And you may ask, well, what's the Mexican connection? I believe it goes something like this. Uh, the drug dealer puts his cash into a business account in the United States. It is exported to China for the purchase of whatever. And I would stipulate here, without any specific knowledge, that it could be for bootleg uh, software. It could be for entertainment 
uh, CDs. Uh, and then here it comes back to Mexico and is sold by a business on the street for a substantial markup uh, because bear in mind they don't have to pay all those pesky copyright uh, fees or anything else that might add to your costs. And now it goes back to the cartels, to the drug dealer. Um, now, unless there are quick questions, I'll, I'll, I'll go quickly into the next method because I don't want to – okay. Uh, we'll go very quickly through this. Um, money transmitters, my focus has been on Western Union and on the ways that money gets transmitted across the board by wire. And so I'd like to just focus on one problem that I think is right here, right now. Uh, you basically have the same problem, large amounts of dollars in the United States that need to be moved into Mexico without attracting attention. Okay, keep it under the $10,000 limit. Keep, well, uh, for an individual transaction, under the $3,000 limit. They can't receive over 10. So here we have a, uh, a situation that's set up and is operating right now between the United States and Mexico where you have a money transmitter, not Western Union because they don't operate this way, but there are other money transmitters who are in the United States ready to send money wherever in the world. Uh, there is a master payer, uh, usually a bank or a financial institution in Mexico, who then has sub-agents. And frankly, it's the sub-agents I want to focus on because they're a group of people who are not vetted by the, uh, the money transmitter in the United States. I don't know that they're vetted by anybody. They could be cartel agents for all I know. Uh, but they are the key players in this particular scenario because they make a list. And the list is this little bit on the right where they make up names, frankly, of uh, uh, alleged senders uh, excuse, and receivers of money. And they take, let's say they have to move a million dollars. Uh, they break it down into a number of apparently random transactions. They assign fictional names to them. Uh, and now they send them to their compatriots in the United States who then promptly uh, contact uh, a third party who makes, who goes into the office of the money transmitter and now sends these to, uh, to their counterpart, the sub-agent in, in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, he pays out the money, presumably to the cartel, and then walks into the master payer's office and said, here's my list of people. I paid them today. I'd like to have my reimbursement. So the sub master payer now reimburses the sub-agent uh, and then asks, for the, uh, the U.S. money transmitter to send him the money to reimburse him. Um, this is a terrible situation because uh, <laughs> what we were dealing with in Western Union at least allowed us to suspend the money when we had a suspected transaction. This one, the money's already been paid before you get the slightest idea in the United States who is receiving it. And that, frankly, is a loophole that is sucking huge amounts of money across the border with virtually no reporting. Uh, this is the summary. I know nobody can read that. Um, so let me go on and summarize the, the, the last part that I just wanted to mention quickly. Um, and this is brokered accounts. We have specialists, very often very sharp financial operatives in the United States, some in Mexico, who are specialists in moving money, and they do it through the financial system. Uh, so right now your TCO is talking to a broker uh, who has operations on both sides and says, I have to move X number of dollars. It's a business transaction. Uh, they then find uh, agents in the United States and the cities where that particular TCO is, has operations. Uh, they now set up a lot of bank accounts, some perhaps phony, uh, others uh, apparently business related, but they have enough to move a significant amount of cash. And that then allows them to take, they, they just act as the agent. They're given $10 million, they farm it out among a whole lot of small accounts, maybe hundreds. They then re-aggregate them, uh, usually in wires across the border, and this, this slide does not show that right. Instead of going to the broker in the United States, they should be moving across the border uh, by a bank transfer. Uh, they're picked up by the uh, broker, they're re-aggregated and turned over to the TCO. Uh, for about 3% of the total, uh, the brokers do extremely well. So let me just summarize with a couple of things I think have to be done uh, in this country if we're gonna take this problem seriously. The first one is plug the loophole for stored value instruments. Uh, that, that is just amazing that it's continued. Uh, the next one is to uh, use the money that the, um, the, the data, which was, has now been out there for a year and a half, uh, that was provided through the Western Union settlement, uh, more constructively. You probably have heard about the uh, indictment of one individual in California. Uh, it came to new light just last week when Western Union made a disclosure which basically said we've been served with subpoenas that say that we're a target. Uh, we don't, we're taking this very seriously. We're working with the federal authorities. But here was what was happening. Mr. Wang 
was sending, and this came out the first day that we started getting the data from Western Union. Our, our agent walked in literally to my office and said, I think we have a problem. $68 million a year problem. Uh, because this gentleman was structuring transactions, sending them to China to fictitious addresses, exactly what I described uh, a minute ago in, in theory. Um, sometimes they were as many as 40 a day in, in increments of $2,500. Well, if the first question you have to say is, what is the business purpose that is being uh, promoted here? And if that's not readily apparent, then a follow-up is, is absolutely essential. And the thing that was interesting about this particular situation is it literally showed up on the first day that the Western Union data uh, was available. So there are lots of others out there, I, I am convinced. There must be. Uh, and so the Mr. Wangs of the world need to be watched, need to be carefully uh, 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 scrutinized, and need to be prosecuted. Um, Criminal penalties. I think there'll be a little said in a minute about the Wachovia situation. There may be some others that are like that. In the Wachovia, over $200 billion moved illegally or without proper justification uh, across the border into Mexico. I'm not saying it was all criminal money. Probably not that much. But it certainly went without anybody watching. Nobody went to jail. Nobody was prosecuted criminally. That is a serious problem. And as these happen in the future, the, as someone said in the Wachovia situation, nothing changes behavior in the banks as much as the rattle of handcuffs in the boardrooms. And that's something we have never heard uh, so far in this country, and it needs to start. Um, we, okay, er, Eric's given me this, but let me, sh let me have one other item. Uh, we need to be able to seize the proceeds of crime. In Arizona, as, you mentioned, as I mentioned, we were able to detain the money under our local laws pending the, the results of the investigation. If we turned out that there was not a problem, obviously it went back. Uh, to the people who are sending it, and they were disadvantaged by a few days. Uh, but the bottom line is the federal government doesn't have that authority. They don't sustain them. They don't detain the money pending investigation. And the result is most of it just goes through their hands. It, it disappears. Accounts are closed. They evaporate. Uh, we have to use the RICO authority far more aggressively. I think in the example of the trade-based money laundering, if somebody is taking a third-party check, as many, many merchants are today along the border, without any knowledge that, uh, of, of who the actual payer, actual buyer is, they need to be prosecuted, and they need to have their businesses seized under the RICO statutes. That will send a powerful message very quickly that this kind of money laundering, which is prevalent on the border and throughout the country, has got to stop. And the last one is Kingpin. Uh, just last week, apparently, uh, it was decided that Chapo Guzman's two sons, uh, I'm sure very nice young men, uh, uh, were constituted a criminal threat and that their assets in the United States should be seized. I'm sorry. Why did it take until May of 2012 to figure out that Chapo's sons were involved in a criminal conspiracy? Somebody is just moving very slowly and not getting the message. So I guess my last point is this. We need to unify the effort against, uh, against money laundering. Right now it's in way too many agencies as the other report that's, that was out there today uh, focuses on. Uh, FBI, ICE, uh, DEA, uh, Customs and Border Enforcement, and who knows what else, along with Treasury, are all tasks with going after uh, money laundering. The answer when you have so many agencies is that nobody's in charge, and nobody's doing the job, and nobody's responsible. And that has to change if we're going to take this seriously. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Terry. Okay, we'll throw it to uh, Peter. Peter Fritsch from uh, uh, Fusion GPS, a local research uh, consulting firm, um, but also a well-known uh, journalist, um, bureau chief in Mexico, Buenos Aires, Asia, all over the world you've been. So done terrific work over the years. Um, so thanks. Thanks, Eric, and um, sorry, and thanks to the Wilson Center for you know having me here. Um, I am also not an expert in money laundering. I lived in Mexico for seven years. I lived in Brazil for three, Southeast Asia for four, Brussels for three, Washington for three. Um, and then I was a kid before that. Um, you know, money, Terry's quite correct in that money uh, really is the name of the game here. Um, and it's really under sort of scrutinized by, I wouldn't say law enforcement. But, you know, law enforcement has the tools, uh, you know, They've made great strides in Mexico and in the U.S. in firming some of those things up. The, um, you know, the, the problem is the size and scope 
is so great that it's really quite difficult for folks to keep uh, on top of. Um, Terry in his opening, excuse me, Eric in his opening remarks made a few comments about, he alluded to a uh, Chinese Mexican national named <coughs> Chen Li Yegong, which was a really fascinating case, which is ongoing. Um, he was arrested in 2007, I believe in March, in Wheaton, Maryland, at a Chinese restaurant, which is actually a very good restaurant, by the way. Um, he had been tipped off to a coming raid at his house in Lomas de Chapultepec in, in uh, Mexico City where they found $205 million uh, in cash, mostly dollars, euros as well, some other international currencies. The true ha cash hoard is probably more like $350 million. Um, so that's quite a bit of money. Um, so this is where you get into uh, sort of issues of KYC, um, you know, anti-monitoring anti laws. Know your it's customer. Sorry, know your customer. Thank it's you. not a chicken place. It's not a chicken place. Um, treated like one sometimes. Uh, you know, a lot of the money that he, if you actually look at the court documents here in um, federal court, uh, they're quite an interesting read. Because of course when you look at things like mutual legal assistance treaties and you are defending yourself against extradition, a lot of documents get filed. Um, and you know, he's still fighting that to this day. Uh, he's got a habeas corpus sort of petition being ruled on at the moment. When you look at those cases, what you find is that uh, this guy did extensive banking with Bancomer, Citibank, which is Banamex in Mexico, Bank of America, Deutsche Bank, Commerce Bank, Industrial and Com Commercial Bank of China, and HSBC. Um, in one nine-month period, from June 2006 to March 2007, this guy made about $100 million in transfers. Uh, uh, Us most of which went to pay gambling debts in Las Vegas. He liked the Venetian and, uh, you know, a few others. Uh, he was, I guess, what they call a whale. Um, so, you know, the U.S. government estimated that between 2004 and 2007, he moved about $125 million to pay off some of those debts. A lot of those transfers were in the order of $700,000, $900,000 to a million dollars at a time. Um, so there goes Terry's 10,000K reporting requirement. Uh, so, you know, where were the SARS on a lot of those? Sorry, s suspicious activity reports, et cetera, on a lot of those transactions? Well, they don't exist um, as far as we know. So kind of reminds you how little has actually changed from Wachovia. And if you want to go back farther, you can talk about things like Riggs Bank, right, and the embassy uh, sort of banking business there, which was picked up by Wachovia which was then picked up by HSBC, right? So, um, you know, the other big player here in that particular case were the Casas de Cambio, the exchange houses in Mexico City, um, a lot of which, or some of which, are, you know, run by quite politically connected individuals. There's a couple of them in this particular case that were controlled by big contributors and friends of the ruling government in the PAN, uh, which is on its way out, according to all polls. So, um, you know, I think a lot of this is going to probably see, become a little bit more topical in the coming weeks and months. Um, HSBC itself disclosed last November in a regulatory filing that it um, has, been, has received subpoenas from the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigation, and there's been some subsequent reporting um, in the media, specifically by, mostly by Reuters, on, on those actions, um, and what you are going to find is, I, I predict, um, you know, in, a lot of this comes out of a case in West Virginia, um, frankly, w against HSBC. There was a guy named Barton Adams who was a, basically a physician who was uh, sending tens of thousands of dollars all over the place through HSBC accounts, and the um, prosecutors in that case have indicated that um, this was a great sort of canary in the coal mine for understanding how systematically flawed the repor reporting was um, on compliance, how undertrained a lot of the officers are on KYC issues and AML sort of compliance issues, on Bank Secrecy Act um, requirements, et cetera. So, um, you know, in fact, the prosecutor in that case even went so far as to compare HSBC to Riggs Bank sort of unfavorably. So, <laughs> you know. Pardon me? They're doing a better job. Yeah, well, 
But, but I mean, not to pick on HSBC, right? Because I mean, the truth is, uh, this is a bank with something like 95 million customers uh, and a lot, a lot, a lot of business. You know, what they will typically do in a country like Mexico, and this will be true for Bank of America and anyone else, is they'll run a name through WorldCheck or some or some other sort of, um, you know, sort of clearinghouse like that for information and due diligence. And if nothing ha comes up, off you go. Um, the Casas de Gambio themselves are. Um, you know, certainly not well trained in the uh, r reporting requirements under Mexican law or U.S. law. So, you know, some some of the some of the um, documents filed in that HSBC matter, which are this is all public record stuff, by the way. This is all reported by Reuters and others. That uh, you know, they were gr apparently at one point in May of 2010, the bank's backlog of alerts was growing at nearly about fifty thousand dollars a month. Um, and growing exponentially. There's just no way those are all going to turn, turn into SARs, and there's no way they're going to catch a lot of this, um, a lot of this business. So, you know, I think um, what you're going to find in coming weeks and, de and, and months is that, you know, you'll have a legislative committee hearing, I predict, uh, that'll look at, you know, probably a bunch of banks, including HSBC. I think you're going to, um, hear a lot uh, subsequently from law enforcement, right? Because typically when the Hill gets going, that's when DOJ, Office of the Comptroller, et cetera, uh, start get going, right? And you'll see FinCEN weigh in and Treasury, et cetera. All this is good, um, I think. Um, and that gives me a sort of a, an opportunity to talk about the role of the media a little bit, right? Which is, I used to be a member of. Uh, you know, the, the sad truth is a lot of the hard work of running this stuff down, which is a lot of s time spent with boring court documents, et cetera, just doesn't get done anymore. Um, too many news outlets are too busy uh, chasing uh, eyeballs on their websites, et cetera, and they just don't do this work. This sort of enterprise journalism just doesn't happen. Um, and a lot of it is hiding in plain sight. It uh, requires a lot of you know, hard work um, with documents and source interviews. So. I, you know, that's pretty much all I would say about that. Yeah, I th thanks, Peter. Um, I, I, you, this last point you made is interesting because it, it does, the, one of the parts of this uh, crime, I mean, it's a white collar crime, I guess, and it's just more difficult to investigate. Uh, it's much easier, I guess, to report on the beheading of 49 people and in Monterey, it's right, right in front of you, um, and uh, but then to go out and, and and dig through, you know, thousands of transactions to try to figure it out. So, uh, I, I you know, it, th there's a built-in. But, but the, the, the surprise. I'm like looking skeptical simply yeah, because yeah. the low-hanging fruit is is extraordinary. The 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 perfume salesman in Laredo who was netting 25 million dollars. I mean, excuse me, but yeah. that does sure. jump off the page. Uh, the toy company in Industry City, California, that is laundering money and suddenly has profits in the multi-million dollar range, these are not that tough. Uh, granted, some of, some of these are very sophisticated schemes, but we're letting the easy ones go. Yeah, good point, good point. Um, let me just say a couple words, uh, final words here before we open it up for your questions and comments. Um, first of all, I think, you know, we've all agreed there needs to be more focused and focused attention across government and between the U.S. and Mexico on this element, and, and internationally, frankly. Um, but we recognize that the trade, the, the methods, uh, mechanisms of um, laundering move rapidly and change rapidly. And become more sophisticated and more complex. I take your point, Terry. I agree. There are many simple ones out there, too, and we, we need to grab those. But there are other schemes being developed. So I think one point we probably all agree on, uh, although we didn't say it explicitly, is that none of us, and certainly Selena and her paper and I personally, you know, believe that this is – uh, going to be the magic wand or the smoking gun that's going to stop this whole transnational organized crime phenomenon. 
what, what it can do is disrupt their way of doing business and increase the cost of doing business. Uh, and to give them a pass, which is I guess what we're hinting at here, uh, is a mistake. Um, how much exactly we can increase the cost of doing business, how much we can disrupt is subject to question. Some people think really it's hardly worth it because every time you shut something down, they go somewhere else. But uh, again, I think there's accumulation of efforts uh, that need to take place and, and efforts uh, uh, we need to reform and change what we're doing to try to uh, take away some of the profit uh, and, and focus on the money side of it. Now, I don't want to uh, paint a totally negative picture here or of complete ineptness. Uh, uh, there's certainly a lot of things that aren't being done and problems. But um, there are some examples of good cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, I might point to two, uh, mostly through the Justice Department and in Mexico, the Procuraduría General de la República, the National uh, Attorney General's Office there as well, anti-money laundering and forfeiture uh, programs, working groups, coordination between the two uh, around that, trying to uh, provide Mexico and Mexican uh, prosecutors with some expertise, some training based on U.S. experience. Uh, I, I would be the first to say we haven't had a perfect experience in the United States as we've highlighted here, but there are obviously learnings that can be passed on and ways in which people can work together. And secondly, uh, in March of this year, the announcement by Attorney General Holder and Maricela Morales, the Mexican Attorney General, of a, a, a what's called a sharing, a $6 million sharing agreement, a uh, letter of uh, understanding or intent to share $6 million in forfeitures uh, with Mexico as a way to uh, allow them to uh, have the resources necessary to uh, continue on these kinds of prosecutions. Small, admittedly, $6 million when you're talking billions of dollars but a step, I guess, in the right direction. I would also recommend, highly recommend, uh, that you look at the paper from Selena Realullo. She has an extensive list of policy suggestions and options. So does Terry in his paper. I, I won't go through them in great detail, but I just wanted to highlight a, a, a couple of them. One is the kind of the standard line that we, we often throw out there without a great deal <laughs> of um, substance behind it, but, but uh, the U.S. and Mexico must demonstrate the political will and continued resolve to focus on that. And I think if you read the paper, you'll see that there's some specific ways in which uh, that becomes important. Uh, one of them we've highlighted already, the United States has a very fractured uh, 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 governmental environment uh, I I overseeing the money laundering efforts from DHS and various agencies within DHS, the Justice Department and various agencies, Treasury. Uh, it's a very fractured environment, and so we need to have the political will in the United States to bring those things together in a more sensible, coordinated fashion, um, either by putting them all under one department, which I'm not advocating for, but or the alternatives have a better coordinated interagency process. Um, secondly, she's suggesting a coordinating mechanism um, between the U.S. and Mexico uh, for to combat binational transnational uh, criminal organization uh, finance working group. And some of the fracturedness of the U.S. Uh, government uh, uh, is plays itself out in the relationship with Mexico because justice is, uh, has a relationship with the Procuraduría, the Attorney General there, and so does uh, the State Department with the State Department or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And so it gets repeated, that fracturedness. And so bringing those various factors together in a coordinated binational financial working group would be another way of really demonstrating um, the political will. And thirdly, um, the
the U.S. And, and, and the Obama administration have announced a new strategy on combating transnational criminal organizations, uh, but there hasn't yet been uh, the real buildup of personnel, uh, the real commitment of resources that focuses on that specific element. Um, it's there. It's provided for in the uh, uh, President's uh, executive order. But we really need to put some meat on the bones, if you will, uh, at that front. Likewise, in Mexico, there's a lot of things that the Calderon administration has done on its own, but there are some legal reforms that have been stuck in Congress now for years. And frankly, with the time running out on the Calderon administration, we may not see those laws pass. Uh, in this government. Now, I'm not saying the next government wouldn't necessarily start over, but it's really been lingering for a long time now in Congress, and those things need to, to, to move forward. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, we have some mics. Alex, uh, Miguel, uh, raise your hand. Identify yourselves with the mics. Um, uh, Michelle uh, and Chris in the back. Uh, maybe I'll take three, uh, and then we'll try to do another round. Keep it short because we do uh, want to get a lot of people. Um, Michelle is here, Michelle Waslin. I'm actually Amy Pope. I'm at the Department oh. of Justice. Oh, <laughs> but the, if it the gives light me a is chance flashing me in the eye. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, to suggest that the government it does not have a strategy or is not prioritized fighting illicit finance really just misses the mark. Um, I think some of the things that would be helpful for the group to know is that, for example, in our asset forfeiture and money laundering unit um, section at the criminal division, we've actually created a unit focused comprehensively on going after illicit finances in Mexico. It's a new unit. Um, it's established within the past two years, but it's just sort of one example of the, the importance that we're placing on the issue. Similarly, at our fusion center that is um, run by DEA, but which incorporates ICE and customs and every law enforcement um, uh, federal agency in, in the area, we also have a person whose sole focus is on pulling in the money piece of all of our investigations. Um, similarly, the work that we're doing in country is really unprecedented. We have, we do actually have a, um, a bilateral illicit finance working group with our Mexican partners in Mexico. Um, we do have a tremendous partnership with our um, colleagues both at the um, illicit finance unit, the WEF, and also at the PGR. And that partnership is one we share with Treasury um, State Department. It's not, it's not a fractured approach. We really are working together. Um, that's not to say that uh, we can't do more. It's not to say that I'm not here, that I will not sit down with anybody and take um, suggestions, advice about how we can do better, because we can do better. But to say that we're not prioritizing it or that we haven't turned our focus to the importance of money um, is just missing, missing the mark, and I want to make sure that that's clear. Well, it's certainly not clear, uh, to me anyway. Uh, certainly, if you look at the budgets uh, for defensive operations on the border, Customs and Border Patrol and ICE, uh, much greater than you have in justice uh, for going after money. Uh, and so it's not on a priority basis uh, in, in the federal government. And I think there have been some great things. The fusion centers have done fabulous work, uh, but they are still fairly isolated. And the kind of comprehensive uh, approach that I think we're talking about here, which clearly puts money at where it belongs, in my opinion, uh, at the top of the pyramid for what has the greatest impact on shutting down organized crime. And, uh, you know, from the mafia through the cartels in Cartagena, uh, I don't think there's any doubt that that is where the resources ought to be. And we're not using the same playbook we used in Colombia. And I don't understand why not. And I'm actually sure that's right, but I would love to expand with you afterwards. And sure. Great. Uh, Chris, Chris Ash in the back from the State Department. Then we'll come forward here and then over there. Um, I appreciate your comments. And um, in, it's on or off? Um, in Central America, I, I think one of the things that's important to mention, and uh, again, this is Mexico focused, <coughs> um, there needs to be a lot of capacity built in that region in terms of the interdiction of bulk cash, um, preventing the movement of financial instruments, there's a lot of trade-based money laundering. And, and one of the things that I was struck by that you said that I don't think we pay enough attention to, 
In Central America, we have a lot of airports where you have commingling of domestic and international travelers. The domestic people come in with bags of cash. Somebody hops in an international flight, they're off. We have, um, in some of the different countries, we've got huge apartment buildings going up. Who's going to live there? I mean, there are clear instances of using real estate in Central America for money laundering. We have bulk cash, but frankly, there's just not much being done. And um, I, I do think the U.S. government, we're going to focus a bit more, but I'm hard-pressed to remember the last time there was a U.S. Um, investigation that has led to seizure of funds in Central America. There's one case in um, Panama that's quite old at this point, but um, I think the Central Americans themselves need to do more. And we, we talked about the DTOs. Frankly, building capacity in these countries is important because you have weak institutions in Mexico and Central America where you need organizations that can go after the domestic um, corruption that is DTO-led, it's transnational gangs, uh, it's organized crime, it's corruption. There needs to be a holistic view, and I, I think the DTO focus is important, but unless we look at the capacity of these countries to actually identify and, and deter the use of their systems for domestic and international, we're not going to hit what we need to hit, and it's just there's a lot of vulnerability there, and um, I think that the international community as a whole needs to hold political leaders in these countries more accountable for allocating domestic resources to make this a key component because, frankly, you're right. We focus on the interdiction of the drugs, and you don't hear as much about the importance of getting the proceeds of the crime, and they don't want to do this to be nice people, and it's fun to do. Um, it, it's about the money, and I, I think we need to focus more on that. But Thanks. I think there's still a perception that money laundering is a victimless crime, that it uh, is just in the financial centers. How else can you explain Wachovia drawing no criminal prosecutions? Um, clearly not a victim when you have the kind of mayhem that we're seeing in Mexico today. And, and that th those are all victims, I believe, of failures on the money laundering side. Yeah, remember in Wachovia, they ended up paying $110 million, right? Forfeiting $110 million and paying a $50 million fine for monies used to move 22 tons of cocaine. Oh, and buy 747s and... Right, uh, and landing them in the Yucatan Peninsula. So, you know... Hundreds of people's died because of that, if not thousands. Building capacity centers are all great, but I mean, the banks that are allowing Casas de Cambio to nest in, you know, offshore accounts, et cetera, all those sorts of things, you, you have to punish them. If you don't, it won't stop. Okay, we have a question here, and then we'll come back here, right? Go ahead, yeah. Alex. Thank you. I'm Eric Sterling from the Criminal Justice Policy Foundation. In the 1980s, I was counsel to the House Subcommittee on Crime and organized the hearings on money laundering that we held and wrote the legislation in 1984 that amended the Bank Secrecy Act and the Money Laundering Control Act of 1986. Um, at that time, we saw money laundering through the gambling casinos. Um, the problem that you've identified um, and the failure of the government to address it is long-term and institutional. The defensiveness of the de Justice Department here is an example, you know, of, of the complete failure. Look at how many cases are brought. There are 25,000 federal drug cases a year. Most of them are low-level offenders, according to the Sentencing Commission. Maybe there are 100 or a couple hundred money laundering cases compared to 25,000, you know, low-level drug cases being brought by U.S. Attorney's offices all over the country. Um, Professor Mark Osler at St. Thomas uh, Law School, former U.S. Attorney, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney, you know, says, look, if we're serious about this, we have to stop focusing on the drugs altogether and on the drug dealers and look at the money. Um, you know, there's the old saying at the Justice Department, little cases, little problems, big cases, big problems. You know, and, and that reflects this. These are all big cases. These are not cases U.S. attorneys and assistant, you know, are really going to bring because they are really hard work. They don't, because the structure of rewards, the structure of promotion, the way in which people are evaluated doesn't give adequate credit to this. At the top, we've got a drug czar focusing on the political sideshows of medical marijuana instead of leading a real strategic vision of, of what we could do. Attorney General Goddard, you've got the right idea. And until the political will changes, uh, we're going to be stuck with the defensiveness of the Justice Department and the fractured approach. 30 years from now, we'll have a conference just like this talking about you know, our new initiatives, our new office, our new program. Until the changes are made, this is not going to change. But if that happens, we won't have a partner in Mexico, I'm confident, if 30 years from now, with, with what's moving today. Okay, there was a question here or a comment. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Thanks. Uh, Jose Luis Stein from the Mexican Ministry of Finance. Right. First of all, uh, Attorney General, I think you've made a very interesting presentation and you put the, the finger in very relevant topics. Uh, some of them have been or are, in or are in progress of being addressed. Some of them, in fact, have to be dealt with. Uh, in particular, you mentioned the restrictions in Mexico to U.S. dollars. This is not so much restrictions to having accounts with dollars, but restrictions to receiving dollars per month. Uh, this was actually uh, the result, these limitations were the result of a bilateral study in which different agencies from both the U.S. and Mexico participated which led to identify which uh, there were important amounts, billions of US dollars that did not have a, a precise economic uh, justification. So we had no certainty whether they were coming from legal or non-legal uh, resources. And these restrictions in just two years, they came in effect in June 2010, have had the result of a decrease of 70% of the amount of dollars in cash that uh, entered the Mexican financial s uh, system. Yes. So it's a restriction to cash only. That's another precision which is important. And m Mr. It's had a major impact. Is, is it ha I've it's seen. had a major impact. And it was a result of bilateral efforts in, in, a, in a great measure. Uh, the other thing that Mr. Peter Fritsch has mentioned was the Casas de Cambio. This was indeed a major problem and we can also say that her, there have been important advances. Since 2010, there are high regulations which have led to only nine casas de cambio existing nowadays compared to, I don't know, there wasn't a huge number before. And they are now supervised by the National Banking Commission as, as instead of the equivalent to the IRS, which is the SAT. Uh, this is important because the CMBV, which is the National Banking Commission, has a lot of experience in supervision. They are the supervisor for banks and other entities. And last, I would also like to back up uh, Amy Pope in what sh she mentioned. Uh, it, it, there are many actors working in this together. And of course, there are many challenges. But uh, it's a very integrated group, a very a multi-agency group, and most recently there's this bilateral group in which, uh, for example, you mentioned ICE. ICE is included within it. Thanks very much. C could I respond just a second? Sure, um, sure. And, and, and perhaps this is a question for Ms. Pope. Um, the, it, to be effective, uh, I, I think we would stipulate, especially in this room, that, that we need both countries uh, totally engaged. And, and when FinCEN and the Mexican finance people sat down and looked at the number of dollars that could not be accounted for by legitimate business, I believe the number they came up with was something in the neighborhood of $17 billion. Did, am I no, approximately no, it, right? No, it was lower. It was, there was, uh, during 2008, 2007, there were approximately $14 billion that were getting into the financial system. Of these, around 7 to 10 okay. could be identified to, uh, to, to its economic origin. So it was four to seven that there was doubts whether they were legal or not. Well, I understood it was a bigger, but that, the, 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 that, that I don't want to argue about that. It's, it's that right now, today, the Justice Department is watching people go from Mexicali to Calexico with backpacks full of cash. Uh, I believe that's a direct result of a very commendable program that the Mexican government has taken to try to reduce the number of dollars that cannot be accounted for in legitimate financial transactions. And yet, as far as I can tell, we're doing nothing about it. Uh, people are lined up at the border. They're bringing cash across. They're depositing it in, in financial institutions in the United States. I presume, without knowing specifically, that that money would not be taking that route unless it was part of the unaccounted for, probably drug dollars, that, that uh, are, are floating in the Mexican economy. I, eventually, you have to say, when you have an anomaly, and that's clearly an anomaly, law enforcement has to take action. And as far as I know, they're, they're, they're watching it, but every day, thousands, if not millions of dollars are going into American banks that are coming from Mexico in backpacks. What are we doing about it? Okay, well, yeah, I, I mean, as you mentioned, as it's been more difficult to enter the dollars into the financial Mexican system, the big question is where they're heading. And- Well, I know where some of them are. Well, y uh, you mentioned it already. Uh, 
Now, what I can tell is, believe me, there are efforts and studies going on in order to understand that flow. What's happening with the specific cases? I don't know. That's a question that U.S. authorities should respond, not, not – U.S. authorities should, and know your customer ought to be opposed. And if some hip, excuse me, if somebody is sitting there pulling $100 bills out of a backpack, it seems to me it's incumbent upon the financial institution to at least file a SAR, if, if not to actually s find some way to suspend the transaction, because there is no legitimate commercial rationalization for what's going on today in Calexico. There's none that I can figure out. Maybe somebody can explain it to me. Any other uh, questions, comments people want to make? Chris. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, you know, I think I've heard the, the, the majority of drug uh, proceeds stay in the United States, as I understand, and, and a smaller portion of them make their way back to Mexico or Colombia, source countries. How do you know um, that? I, I don't know that for sure, but that, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying that, that that's what I've heard, and feel free to take issue with that. Um, if that is the case, and, and maybe you disagree with that, you know, would, should our focus be on international money laundering versus domestic efforts? I guess I've heard a critique from the Mexican point of view saying this is one of the areas where, where the U.S. could really make a big impact on the total flow of, of money and drugs uh, by really focusing domestically, where you know, obviously Mexico has to focus domestically on a certain set of issues in this entire picture of the, the issue of organized crime. And I just want to, you know, throw that out there and see what responses would be to that idea. Well, money laundering is, is, is both. I mean, what we did in Arizona was all domestic money laundering. That was illegal transportation of, of, of funds uh, in excess of the, you know, not reporting the federal limits, not following any of the rules, and it had been done for years. Uh, we stopped it within one state, and I'm quite confident it's probably going on in other states and, and across the border uh, without adequate uh, identification. Uh, so it seems to me, and this is one of the, I think, the other false uh, uh, ideas that's out there, is that I, I think, at least I've supposed, that some of the failure to go after cartel money laundering and drug money is that it's not terrorist related. But frankly, the same techniques that I had up on the board and many others uh, can be used as easily by terrorist organizations as they can by the cartels. And when you open the door to one, you open it to, to everybody. So it seems to me that... that we have to have a focused national effort to reform our financial situation system so that m money laundering is not tolerated. And right now, the, the message that we're sending through Wachovia and through hundreds of other cases is that in spite of the fact that it's happening right in front of us, um, a, a tremendous uh, amount is, is apparently tolerated. No criminal, no criminal sanctions except for the very smallest fry that are out there. Uh, an apparent unwillingness to look at this treasure trove of data that I provided through the Western Union uh, settlement, um, that has two benefits, it seems to me. One, it gives you a real-time uh, uh, snapshot of what's happening in literally hundreds of businesses and, and locations around the world uh, and around the United States and through Mexico. Um, that can be very valuable because it allows you to spot anomalies and to react to them uh, very, very quickly. The other is the upstreaming of these investigations. And that's something a state cannot do, but the federal government can. You, you get a suspected wire uh, in Arizona. What I would want to know if I were a federal authority is who sent it and what else are they involved in. And again, those are investigative leads that I do not believe are being followed. And the last part is wire uh, wiretaps. Uh, I think there's a lot of justifiable uh, apprehension right now after Fast and Furious that uh, you can't let money fly, as they did in the Columbia situation. Hundreds of millions of dollars were laundered by government officials in order to bring in the Colombian operatives so that they could arrest them, prosecute them, and arrest them. Um, Maybe uh, the Fast and Furious uh, uh, lesson is you can't do that anymore. Uh, but what you can do is use, for instance, the wire transfer data to get a sufficient probable cause to be able to, to put wires on to people who are involved in these criminal operations and to go from there. And that's very profitable, I know, at the state level, ought to be at the federal level. Uh, Mexico has recently amended their criminal code so they can use wiretaps much more frequently. I think that's great. Uh, but what Eric mentioned before is that there's a great reform on financial crimes in the Mexican Congress that hasn't moved yet. And were that to happen, it would dramatically improve our situation across the border. But I just, 
in closing, having been involved in the training of Mexican officials in the prosecution side, I think what, what that country has done in the last five years is literally to move 100 years forward in terms of realistically confronting a criminal threat. And they don't get enough credit for it, in my opinion. It's been amazing. I, I'd agree with that. And I, I'm interested to hear what you say about the Casa de Cambio. I, I wasn't aware of that. And that's an important um, change to put it under the CMDV. Um, you know, I'd also say that you know, among some of the larger commercial banks, I think they are starting to understand that their AML and compliance and you know, anti-money laundering stuff is, is, is real. And they are starting to equate it with you know, a terrorist sort of like threat. I mean, the, you know, exhibit A there would be you know, HSBCs. I mean, I hate to pick on them, but you know, they named Stuart Levy, the former undersecretary of Tine finance for terror finance as their chief legal officer. You know, he's not going to be there to, um, you know, frustrate uh, discovery when it comes to, you know, KYC violations, et cetera. He's going to take it seriously. I mean, he's someone I knew in my former life. Um, um, and to me, that's a really good sign. You know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one last comment. Uh, we need to wrap it up here, but go for it. Can you just uh, say it again, just so that I think it's on. It's on, yeah. My name is Ahmad Ali, and I'm a Humphrey Fellow at the University of Minnesota Law School. My question is actually, uh, if these money launderers they uh, transfer money by way of uh, uh, you know smuggling, simply they transfer money cross border through uh, mm, uh, informal borders which is not necessarily there are immigration or uh, other check post, law enforcement people. What are the measures, enforcement measures available in order to check that undocumented sort of transfer of money, bulk cash as a way of just, you know, other commodities and uh, goods, for example? Um, I, I guess technically bulk cash isn't money laundering. Um, it, it's the movement of cash um, because you don't have to go through any intermediaries. Um, the, the big issue now is converting it to pesos, which uh, I think is what we're now talking about in terms of dollars coming back. They've been smuggled into Mexico. Now because Mexico won't keep them, uh, <laughs> they're being moved back to the United States in plain sight. Um, we, we know it's happening, we're watching it happen, and as far as I know, no official action is being taken to stop it. Uh, that would be a pretty good first step. But uh, are you saying uh, are dollars treated as a commodity or as a? Bulk cash, uh, transferring from one, uh, for example, from uh, US to Mexico and vice versa. Uh, like a commodity, you're smuggling cash, for example, because you don't want to, uh, uh, I mean, put uh, those money into the banking channel, otherwise it would be detected, as you said, this uh, 10,000 limit is there, Maybe. for example. Yeah. So this is happening between, you know, Afghanistan and Pakistan borders. They are using just, uh, uh, you know, crossing border th uh, through mules and other animals with lots of cash, and that is simply uh, not detectable for the law enforcement authorities. So. The only, uh, the only way I know is the solution that, that was found between the United States and Mexico, which is to analyze the whole economy and figure out how much is there that you simply can't account for except through criminal operations. I, does that, I, I thought what we did jointly with FinCEN and, and Mexican finance was, was on the only way you can get a handle on that, and it's a very imprecise art. Uh, you know, most of what we're talking about here today, again, the, the, the criminals don't file quarterly reports. And... It is, they're terribly deceptive about exactly how much they're making. But I do think it's a mistake without knowing the facts to underestimate how much we're talking about here. Uh, clearly, and again, just looking at the results on the southwest border, we have an opponent in the cartels who are as well financed and as sophisticated as you can possibly imagine. Uh, they have all the new toys, they have all the new technology, they have the best trained people, and they have the best. Uh, operations and they're running rings around our border protection and the reason they're doing that is because they are it's incredibly well financed so it seems to me that just as a very bottom line basic tenant if we're serious about border defense and there's lots of 
hue and cry and lots of statements uh, made uh, with politicians beating their chests saying that's our number one priority and we can't have immigration reform until we secure the border. And yet the number one way to secure the border is to stop the flow of cash and that's not the priority. And it seems to me that's a nonsensical juxtaposition of priorities that has to be changed. Or we've got to admit we're not serious about having a secure border. Great. Well, thank you, Terry, very much. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it. Um, again, I think just as a concluding remark, I don't think anybody is, any of us are saying we're not doing anything, nothing is being done. It's a matter of prioritization, and I think we're trying to make the case that it could be a higher priority. Good. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, the immigration issue is so often siloed and not looked at in the context of broader political um, goals and objectives, and consequently the rhetoric around the perception and sort of national polarized. And so this is one of our efforts to try to, you know, reach across different disciplines to talk through those issues. So I encourage you, if you're interested in that effort, to check out his papers, but also the dedicated effort to talk to me afterwards. So thanks a lot. All right. Thank you.